pleased to welcome Robert, Robert Anderson, a writer whose work has been published in The Guardian and in many other newspapers, and he's currently working on a well, play. Well, four, four projects. On a number of drawn projects. And, drawn and quartered, yeah, four yeah. projects. <laughs> yeah. Which you can find listed in our little flyer here. But the project we're most interested to hear about is a play called The Tea House at the Otolwe Bridge. Robert. Thank you. Um, I want to bring this discussion full circle back to 1945, which is where we began. I was, I was born in 1945. I'm a co-evil with the bomb. That's E-V-A-L. Uh, but actually, I enjoyed seven weeks of nuclear-free existence. So I'm probably the only one here who has actually experienced that. And hopefully, we can get back to that in the 21st century at some point. Um, so I'm just going to give you a, a brief background of how this play came into existence and then we're going to read uh, Act 1, Scene 2, which is the Bohr Oppenheimer dialogue. So this is, this is called, the title of this paper is, The Tea House Serves the Bomb, a Repast for the Year 75. I have three epigraphs. Is it big enough, Niels Bohr? Not the smallest part of the life we came to lead, Miss Warner, was you. Evenings in your place by the river, by the table so neatly set, before the fireplaces so carefully contrived, gave us a little of your assurance, allowed us to belong, took us from the green temporary houses and the bulldozed roads. We shall not forget. I am glad that at the foot of our canyons, there is a house where the spirit of war is so well understood. Philip Morrison. This is not a species to be trusted with nuclear weapons. Daniel Ellsberg. One. Leave it to Leo Zillard to show up uninvited, lugging his quick escape suitcases even in death. Conscience stricken as ever. A recusant spirit spoiling the preprandial bonhomie with loaded questions about crimes against humanity. The self-styled war criminal just can't leave it alone, can't let Hiroshima live down its singular hecatomb. What is done, what's done is done ad nauseum. Ancient history, what more to say about the bomb, about death and life, especially when you're dead yourself? No, leave it to a reproving, leave it to a reproving Zillard to stir the pot, knock on mall. So just when Bohr and Oppenheimer were beginning to let down their guards and relish anew the hospitality of, of Edith Warner, who took great pains in recreating the tea house just as it was, savor the pinion redolent candlelit interior, salivate over the rag out of lamb on the wood stove and the fable of chocolate cake that defeated hill fever. Zillard barges in to browbeat to browbeat the revenant pair into owning up to a lack of moral imagination. He who never stepped foot on the hill in life, you go crazy up there, he famously said in 1943, now shows up in death to lecture the great Dane about his responsibility to the historical record. Talk about crazy. Instead of a well-deserved rest from their posthumous personas, from their histrionic labors in Copenhagen and Dr. Atomic, respectively, Bohr and Oppenheimer find themselves starring in another morality play, like it or not. They do not. Oppenheimer can't catch a break from being typecast as the I am become death heavy, afflicted with blood on his hands and super, supernova ambition in his soul, his Faustian bargain dooming him to endless performances, to endless performance as the destroyer of worlds. No wonder he shows up at the tea house in cowboy garb, sporting spurs and wearing a Native American war bonnet. Behold the operatic evisceration of the tormented polymath, spilling his guts as the American Hamlet. Watch him wax poetic as he wrests the primordial powers from the cosmic order. The lurid thunder and lightning countdown to Trinity grists for the labored Dr. Atomic libretto, a crime against humanity personified by a human gargoyle. The song of the Rio Grande, this is not. The American Prometheus brought low. Eat your heart out, J.R.O. 
Verbore his birthright Copenhagen, wonderful, wonderful Copenhagen, now conjures a cruelty at the hands of an English playwright, an ordeal night after night of reliving, reliving the nature of the occupation. The night Heisenberg came to call, seeking what exactly? Not expatriation, not exculpation, certainly not expiation. Bad enough to be summoned from the peace of the grave to go round and round with his estranged wartime caller, an integral part of the family not so long ago, circumspection, a too painful but too body problem. But to involve his beloved wife, Marguerite, to force them to relive the drowning of their eldest son, Christian, all the while a smug Heisenberg is leading him into a verbal trap. Admit it, Bohr, that you are the one with blood on your hands. This is too much for the eminence griefs to live down. Still reeling from the coup de theater, move over Galileo, the English Brecht has Bohr's atomic number. So every reason to be wary about an, inv about an invitation to a repast prepared by the redoubtable Edith Warner herself. Who knows what verbal traps will be set, even if the playwright is a Robert from Berkeley Physics, whose Danish surname is literary gold in Copenhagen. No, having set his play, Having set his play inside the refuge of the tea house, knowing full well that Mr. Baker and Mr. Opp could not resist the temptation to retreat to their favorite wartime idol, to the comfort of Miss Warner's comfort food, when the bomb was still the great hope, and the song of the Rio Grande could still be heard in dulcet sonority, our playwright, employing two high maintenance, high dudgeon Hungarians as aggrieved foils, a lugubrious Leo Zillard and a lathered Edward Teller, will depose the August Trinity, Bohr, Oppenheimer, and Hans Bethe, the conscience of the atomic scientists, in an effort to triangulate the Giornata del Merto, to establish the moral compass that propelled them to ignore the example of Joseph Rotblat and slog on, bearing the cross of humankind across the desert to Trinity and Hiroshima, the journey of death indeed. The faithful spectrum of specters coming and going, Hitler in World War III, to think of Feta Morgana, the dreaded German bomb, had fissioned after all, produced not one but two bombs, the fait accompli of the American bomb, a.k.a. the winning weapon, and the deus ex, a.k.a. the great hope, the science bomb. And not only the bomb, but the super, and not only the super, but the doomsday machine, the whole vast panoply of bombs, big and small, under the command and control of the nuclear triad, each and every one a crime against humanity, each and every one an extinction level event, a 24-7 test of the Bohr-Oppenheimer certainty principle that nuclear arms races end in catastrophe. As I, Robbie, aptly put it after Trinity, quote, suddenly the day of judgment was the next day and has been ever since. On the eve of the 75th anniversary of the bomb, our quartet of revenants backs up thanks to Zillard, sit down to a repast, a rag out of reflection and, and recrimination and rue. Over chocolate cake, Andrei Sakharov, Zillard's war criminal protege, will make an, apparent, an appearance. Richard Feynman, resolute in the wings, will refuse to participate. You're all nuts. Edith Warner, who glides silently through the dinner service, as was her wont, will wait the magic word from Mr. Baker, who she reveres above all others, a deeply felt bond between the two. The spirit of Bohr pervades this tea house, uh, the spirit of war pervades this tea house recreation as well. But playwright's prerogative, the magic words will come from her mouth in a long soliloquy at the end when the spirits of Mr. Baker and Mr. Opp are released into the ether, hopefully never to return to the stage. The final curtain call. Two. This play has been long in the making, all my life in fact. Born in the year zero in May 1945 atop Buena Vista Hill, overlooking Civic Center and the War Memorial Opera House, where the San Francisco Conference was in the throes of birth in the United Nations, perforce a blue, blue diaper baby. I too have been making my peace with total war ever since, in ways martial and erratic, the residue of every nuclear test since Trinity found in my bones, the x-ray of every nuclear scenario found in my psyche. Ban the bomb and brandish the bomb and ignore the bomb. Think the unthinkable, imagine the unthinkable. Counterforce and countervalue. Mad ensures our mental health. 
Little boy leaves San Francisco bound for Tinian in the Bombay of Enola Gay. While this little boy, eight years later, watches in fascination as A-bomb-laden B-36s practice doomsday runs high, over San, high, over, high overhead. San Francisco will have the distinction of being the most atom bomb city on the planet, several hundred sorties a month in the 1950s. The scary footage from the Nevada test site of houses blown away by the shockwave creates two bodies, one flesh and blood, free to enjoy an ordinary boyhood, the other a test site mannequin never to grow up awaiting the shockwave over and over again. Radioactive I am in ways that recount the saga of the bomb and half-lives, of dread and fatalism and activism and intellectualism, enervation and resignation and exultation and renewed alarm. Round and round I go, year in and year out, my two-body problem in Cold War practice. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, down on your knees, a Catholic high school prayer for Marian intercession. A subsequent enlistment in the Navy to serve aboard a Polaris submarine. Service aboard a destroyer carrying three nukes, subkiloton subkillers. At UC Berkeley, as a phys physics undergrad, umpteen trips to Lawrence Livermore to debate and protest. At the Institute of Society, Ethics, and the Life Sciences, where I begin writing about the makers of the bomb in purple prose, Cue the Thunder and Lightning of Trinity. The famous editor who wants me to write the big book of the atomic scientists. A debut in Physics Today with a book review instead of the 60-page essay in Harper's. The nuclear freeze movement, including the Great March in New York in 1982. The year of maximum danger, take two when the world came within a split-second deci decision of triggering the Russian doomsday machine. Like everyone else, I exalted when the Cold War, no little thanks to Nancy Reagan, by the way, enjoyed a Hollywood ending. Indeed, the miracle of miracles, mom, got us out of the 20th century alive, notwithstanding tens of thousands of megatons in the superpower arsenals. Providence had humankind's back after all, the safety locks held, well one did anyway. But just when it looked like nuclear war was dead and buried, consigned those megatons to a hecatomb of their own, INF and START, a hydra-headed nemesis, non, appears, and the obsolete two-state problem, the U.S. and the USSR, now becomes a nine-state proliferation nightmare. Too many fingers on the nuclear trigger. <clears throat> 9-11 reassures that the jihadi bomb remains a specter, for now anyway. The war on terror weaponizes the weapons of mass destruction mantra into a crazy quilt balance of terror, tilting ever so inexorably to the abyss, to a nuclear winter that will arrest global warming with room to spare. The Indus Valley, where civilization began, is the likely place for it to end. The globe is now wired for simultaneous detonation. No shortage of flashpoints. The South China Sea now flashing red to this Navy veteran. Three. The muscle memory of nuclear showdown returns, and so fearful for the immediate future, knock on mall. I land a visiting scholar semester at Notre Dame where I begin thinking anew about the moral imagination of the atomic scientists a subject that defeated me as a young writer turning futile hermeneutic circles. A reconnaissance, a reconnaissance in the library shows me there is, room on the, there is room on the groaning shelf for two slim volumes, one a study of that imagination, the other a drama, an exercise of that imagination. Niels Bohr would approve complementarity at work. The spirit of Bohr is the alpha and omega of this tandem project. Remove Bohr from the nuclear equation, and you have an Oppenheimer inflated to Dr. Atomic stature. Bohr's arrival at Los Alamos in late December 1943 was a galvanic and a game changer. <clears throat> there really is no saga of the atomic scientist without his outsized moral, without his outsized moral intervention. As his friend Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter put it, he was, quote, a man weighted down with a conscience and an almost overwhelming solicitude for the dangers of our people. Just as he had been rescued from Denmark, bringing Danish Jewry with him, so too would he rescue humankind from total war. 
Briefed in England on the stupendous size of the Manhattan Project, Bohr went to Los Alamos as seer and sage, bearer of the good news. Ecstatic he was, where he had made, he had made the most profound discovery of all, embodying, as it were, the Archimedean point itself. Hence the first words out of his mouth upon arrival at the hill, is it big enough? Behold the deus ex, the great hope, the weapon to end all wars. Bohr's sermon on the Mesa turned one wartime emergency into quite another. What the historian John Dower calls idealistic annihilation was the World, 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 World War II endgame set in motion by the Bohr Oppenheimer rescue of humankind from the abyss of World War III, a crime against humanity in order to save humanity. Hiroshima was in the crosshairs of the fait accompli, the winning weapon, a Groves Oppenheimer production, saved from firebombing. But it was also in the crosshairs of the deus ex, a Bohr Oppenheimer production. Groves gave the bomb primitive, primitive life by brute force, emergency priority, mighty engineering, Bohr gave it casuistic finesse, diplomatic leverage, moral legitimacy. If Oppenheimer was the demiurge at Los Alamos, Bohr was the thaumaturge in, in residence, the magus of the magic word. Without his high hopes, no trinity. Without his tacit approval, no Hiroshima. Indeed, this dynamic duo cannot be separated by conventional means. One good reason why Oppenheimer looms so large, his abundant U-238 to Bohr's rare U-235. But thanks to the Herculean archival work of Herkin, Sherwin Rhodes, in particular the gravity-bending tomes of Richard Rhodes, we find their rescue mission laid out in plain sight. Bohr accorded the, Bohr accorded the importance he deserves. With Bohr supplying the missing initiative, the Manhattan Project goes critical acquires a scatological purpose and resolve. Indeed, we could say Bohr and not Oppenheimer was the commanding presence at Los Alamos. Thanks to the atomic scientist movement, the bomb, was, the bomb was banned and Hiroshima turned into a peace city, never to forget the five-day preview of World War III. But now the effects of the bomb have run out. Humankind has been pushing its luck to the limit and beyond. Mad has become madness. Now that the smell of burning that unnerved Khrushchev at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis is back, as apocalyptic as ever, issuing this time Tatla Azmuth from the globe as a whole, the prospects of avoiding World War III are two minutes to midnight. Instead of the race to zero, there is now a race to first strike as the we will bury you modernization of the nuclear arsenals proceed apace. Air trigger syndrome is now the state of the art in command and control. The jihadi bomb is only a matter of time. Duck and cover, indeed. Four, back to square one, back to year zero, back to the atomic scientists, back to the rescue of humankind from the abyss, back to the tea house, and Edith Warner and Tolano, Mr. Baker and Mr. Opp. 75 years ago, the Los Alamos Laboratory, Site Y, sprung up overnight mining town style and the newly named director, Robert Oppenheimer, recruited Edith Warner to provide a semblance of civilized life to the scientists landing in the middle of nowhere and laboring on a black hole. Instead of, go instead of going under following the Chile line in the Los Alamos Ranch School into oblivion, the tea house flourished as a retreat and idol for the site Y elite. Reservations were booked months in advance, and the regulars, including Mr. Baker and Mr. Opp, commanded the long table in the middle. Two seatings at $2 a person, no tips, no alcohol. The tea house was too good to be true to its pseudonymous patrons who craved the ambience and cooking of Miss Warner, who together with her Native American helpmate, Tolano Montoya, put in grueling 16-hour days. Water had to be hauled from the well, and without electricity, the Kiva-like space was lighted by oil lamps and the pinion-fed fireplace in the corner. By all accounts, the resulting ambiance was ensorcelling. Hill fever got ameliorated for the tonic hours spent hearkening to the song of the Rio Grande in the company of luminaries who frequented the potlatch, foremost of whom was Mr. Baker, a.k.a. Niels Bohr. 
Edith, who had known Oppenheimer since 1937, when he appeared at the doorstep in full Western regalia, down the spurs, off a trail ride eager for a slice of her famous chocolate cake, had a profound, had a pronounced affinity for Mr. Baker. She always called him by his nom de guerre. Indeed, it is safe to call them soulmates. As Bohr wrote to her sister after her untimely death, Edith, quote, had an intuitive understanding which was a bond between us. Edith had gone native, emerged from a battle of New Mexico-itis to achieve a profound identification with the land, with the indigenous, with human being at, with human being at its aesthetic and aesthetic, aesthetic and aesthetic best. The Rachel Carson of Mesa and Pueblo, a life lived in extreme penury, she became a self-healed vessel of firm practicality and resolute spirituality. A questing spirit, she came to live a life of down-to-earth wisdom and soaring communion with the thonic and the ineffable. She too lived a numinous life around the bend, on the edge of eschatology. She knew what they were doing up on the hill, which is why she refused to go up there during the war. But she always knew that if anyone could turn the bomb into the great hope, it was Mr. Baker, who always got that second slice of chocolate cake. She made sure of that. Five. Five. During the war, her tea, her tea house was a retreat, a place where the spirit of war could find sustenance, a place that recreates itself on the eve of the 75th anniversary of year zero, of the original ground zero. Atomic scientists, too, have to eat, especially those long dead. The, long, the table talk promises to be spirited, combative, above all instructive. After all, there's a lot to discuss, a whole raft of topics about what they had done and not done and what had to be done if humankind was to escape the abyss they had created in a supreme emergency. The ten years that shook the planet to its core, the black hole of the doomsday machine, has their names on it. They made it possible. They own it. They can never escape that patented fate, even if no small irony. Mortality walk was to prove their individual fates. Beta, the level-headed battleship, lasted to 98. What do they have to say about it now that the machine is back in full operation more minatory than ever? Humankind is in need of another rescue from the abyss. Perhaps they have a few good I few ideas, or at least something histrionic, or so at least some histrionic bravado to impart, impart before fading away for good. Six. Bohr and Oppenheimer are the early arrivals, so they enjoy a one-on-one -on -one that relives the glory days when inside the wire meant open range for the visionary ones. Those talks long into the night, the table talk at the tea house, where life, capital L, was duly served by Edith Warner and Tolano. The journey of death was leading to the promised land, war no more, one world or none. The division of labor between the two predicated on the bomb being big enough meant Bohr was the embassy from the future, speaking truth to power, informing the big three that the jig was up. Power politics and another arms race, this one with nuclear weapons, could only lead to World War III and the extinction of humankind, the Bohr-Oppenheimer certainty principle. Oppenheimer had the cold-blooded task of taskmaster, ensuring the bomb would be ready before the war ended and not only ready, but demonstrated on a city as a preview of what was to come. No Hiroshima, no international control of nuclear energy. No international control of nuclear energy, no escape from the marching orders of total war, the ultimate hermeneutics circle. The workload at Los Alamos increased dramatically once it became clear that the German bomb had been at Chimera all along. Only one scientist, Joseph Rothblatt, quit the project. The Bohr-Oppenheimer force field was strong enough to deflect or turn back the moral qualms of going forward. Zillard's last-ditch petition to prevent a Hiroshima was tabled as a result of strong pressure by Oppenheimer himself. Teller allowed himself to be talked out of signing, and the petition was not circulated. Ergo, a beset Zillard crashes the dinner party, and a grudge-filled grudge Teller assails Oppenheimer. And so the bomb becomes the main course, of course. Seven. This repast puts words in the mouth of revenants, a la Copenhagen. 
but it puts the interlocutors into a, in a serene, somnolent setting. Wartime is kept out of sight in the wings. Absent the Hungarians, the evening would be spent in reverie and reflection, hardly the stuff of drama. Acrimony would be absent. The song of the Rio Grande would engulf the voices, especially that of Niels Bohr, notorious for speaking barely above a whisper. You had to lean in to hear what he had to say, which was quite a lot. Bohr was as voluble as he was volume challenged. Later, Oppenheimer would adopt the lower register as well, Delphic style, in his media savvy role as panegyrist of pure science, pure baloney. Winston Churchill had no patience for Bohr. He did not lean in, but rather recoiled at his, quote, hair all over his face presence. Indeed, he gave him the bum's rush. The embassy from the future did not have standing in the prime minister's inner sanctum. Churchill went off on a rant that left Bohr reeling, flummoxed, speechless. He did much better with FDR, an hour and a half on the same wavelength. Bohr emerged from that meeting elated. But his mission to Moscow was aborted, and Bohr eventually found himself rerouted to Oak Ridge instead. Bohr was getting the runaround, which was just fine with General Groves, who also had his eye on the future, quite a different future. No need for international control, it was already under his control. Groves had cornered the world's supply of despair in the form of yellow cake. The winning weapon was American in perpetuity. Talk about leverage. Hope springs eternal, and, the great, and great hope now centered on the bomb to make its one world and none statement. FDR sided with Churchill, found Bohr on the, quote, edge of mortal crimes. Bohr was unacquainted with Kafka's dictum, steeped in bitter irony, quote, he found the Archimedean point, but he used it against himself. It seems that he was permitted to find it only under this condition. Here the what-ifs acquire critical mass, acquire a history of their own. What if Bohr had quit the project, contributed to the Frank Report, signed the Zillard petition, convinced Oppenheimer over dinner at the tea house that the bomb was paced the super four years later, quote, evil in any light. What if he had come to realize the great hope was a great snare and delusion? that the complementarity of the bomb was not a gravid contradiction, build the bomb in order to ban the bomb, but a mental trap. Kafka, not Kant, the bitterest of ironies. <clears throat> what if he had convinced Oppenheimer to quit the project as well? What if he had seen them standing on the edge of mortal crimes and called them back from the precipice? What if he had exercised his moral imagination to swear an oath never to work on nuclear weapons? What if Los Alamos was, was returned to the Indians, as Oppenheimer once quipped? What if Hiroshima was just another firebomb city, and World War III was fought with conventional weapons? A chain reaction of counterfactuals leading to an explosive revelation. There's a lot to chew over at dinner. A gustatory rite of passage. On the eve of the 75th anniversary of Trinity and Hiroshima, the revenants heed the tea house summons for the last time or what promises to be a long evening by the Ottawa Bridge. But first hearken to the song of the Rio Grande, an aria for an operetta. Lights up, the pas de deux of Edith and Tolano. The tea house is back for one night only. Act one, scene two, Bohr and Oppenheimer. Avi Bohr, and he plays Oppenheimer. Um, how good it is to see you again, Robert. I was afraid I'd be paired with Heisenberg for all eternity. At least that's what it felt like in Copenhagen. Night after night after night, round and round and round. Inside a centrifuge. I emerge, my anger famously a rare isotope, weapons grade reenacting a debacle, getting a rise out of Niels Bohr. After Christian's drowning the worst time of my life, the prodigal son returns as an ubermensch, a nightly torture emoting before an audience, well over a thousand performances in London and New York and Los Angeles, staged for what purpose other than to show off the playwright's gift for, for ghoulish exhumation? Whatever happened to the peace of the grave? 
At least your tardy debut, welcome to the stagecraft of the bomb, has historic weight. The audience hung on your every word. You still had gravitas. Serious drama. You could hold your head high. Bravo. The Great Dane, me. The amateur Hamlet routine is served up on a cheap platter. I am become death. Now I have to sing that overcooked refrain in the overwrought opera. Rabbi was right. I should have read the Talmud instead. It worked, was profound enough, and so sleeves rolled up Yankee blunt. So American insecurity, a reversion to the show-off. I was at a loss for words. Would that the three-person God had redacted the Hindu scripture. By now, I should be used to being hauled before the public as Dr. Atomic, radioactive, all right, a half-life of how many transuranic provocations. I've lost count. Certainly no repose for this revenant. Just one damn melodrama after the next. Too bad I don't get royalties. Allegory be not allegorical. Typecast as Faust, Hamlet, Prometheus, take your pick. The repertory of playing the god. No rest for the wearisome. I see the Deutsche Theater in Berlin is reviving in the matter of, which begot the never-ending psychodrama, Look, Blood on His Hands, the lugubrious price for having fathered the bomb. To drag poor Marguerite, who never liked my German son, into it was the worst, an offense against nature. We are at the mercy of mercenaries determined to use our effigies as histrionic boilerplate. One good reason I showed up here in cowboy regalia, just off the trail, clanked those spurs in ripened hygiene, no less. Not yet saddled with the bomb, or Kitty for that matter, my free spirit days. For a moment I thought you were Tom Mix or Hopalong Cassidy, my favorite matinee cowboys. You forgot the six-shooter, but the Indian war bonnet gave you away. So droll in an arch way, had to be you. I wanted to vouch for true grit. The invitation to recreate the tea house was too good to be true. Feared a ruse, another trap, the Yonado del Muerto all over again. Tilano now has a full-time tri full trickster. Gird your loins for another trek to Trinity. I'm so glad I wasn't there. Had to get a start from Edith, or the invitation bogus. After all, this was what I was wearing in 1937 when I rode up to introduce myself to the doyen of the tea house. Then she had to endure notoriety, living with an Indian, such scandal. I knew Edith would never tolerate her effigy. A free spirit then and now. The song of the Rio Grande was a bit much at lights up, but lo and behold, she recognized the get up immediately. The tea house is back for an encore performance. I feel so elated I could break into song, an operetta to be sure. You appeared wearing that headdress? No, I had on my uh, cowpuncher hat then. The eagle feathers were for groves. He didn't think the pork pie hat had had conveyed authority. He kept ragging me about it. So one day before you arrived, I stood before the general, a Comanche war chief, and asked if this conveyed authority enough for him. So very Robert. So now that we are all here salivating. Chewing the fat. A repast for revenants. A rag out of rue. A respite from recrimination. A, a reverie, effigy free, no boilerplate please, a chance to catch up. So wonderful to see Edith again. We had a special bond right from the start. We didn't have to say a word. The olfactory delight alone savor that pinion fire, the rag out on the stove, the aroma of bread right out of the oven is enough to reduce this revenant to tears. How I love this place so far from Washington and London. True West, the song of the Rio Grande indeed. I feel like a schoolboy again. I can't wait for the chocolate cake, though I wish you would allow us spirits wine with our meal. Yes, kudos to the playwright for bringing us together again. I always was happiest there, here, truly an enchanted place. The conversations we had long into the night, Edith had to chase us out, so consumed were we with the vision of one world. Hope was always on the menu. Hope for this drama as well. Robert Anderson, his illustrative Danish surname, does reassure. 
I believe he was a physics student at Berkeley, protested at Lawrence Livermore, what he calls Teller's Soviet City of Science. I think we are in good hands. No, I'm sure of it. But there is always a but. What a playwright could resist the temptation to introduce conflict, I fear the Hungarians. At least we have this scene to relish sheer sentience. Remedial carnal knowledge. I am famished. Let's hope it's Wigner's turn to represent the Martians. I always admired his self-possession, his elegance of thought and deportment. So very middle Europa. Yes, better here than inside the wire. How many recreations of Los Alamos had Opie endured? I always wanted to step out of character and say, no, you're getting it all wrong. That's not how it happened at all. Poor Leslie, poor Kitty. I even feel sorry for Edward, how they love to portray him as my nemesis. I never gave him that stature. One reason why he's had it out for me. Edward always wanted to be larger than life. The super, the super, the goddamn super. I liked the teller of the 30s, so enthusiastic, and fond before he discovered the terrible. Ideas, not bombs, poured out of him. I'm afraid he went off the deep end at Los Alamos, peered too long into the abyss. The bomb was big enough. Well, while waiting for Bette and his mysterious Hungarian guest, why don't we begin? This bread is wonderful, and the salad looks too. Sometimes I wonder if we too hadn't gone off the deep end. Our enthusiasm got the better of us. Super? Colossal. Our calculations were wrong by several orders of magnitude. The strong force was not the bomb, but Churchill's obduracy. Delicious by half. Don't leave out Comrade Stalin, and Roosevelt led you down the garden path. So much for supplicating the three-person God. The big three were too well versed in the Hindu scripture. Destroyer of world peace, all right. Yes, Edith has outdone herself. Save for Talano in a tuxedo, I'd say she has recreated the tea house just as it was. I marveled how she put the old place back together on such short notice. Just for this one night, and no other diners, alas. Just four of us at the dramatist's invitation. This place was always packed. Reservations were impossible to be had. And who needed spirits? The ambience was intoxicating. So many couples flocked here. Kitty hated everything about Los Alamos, except for this place. Edith had to put her foot down. No one wanted to return to the hill. Out you go, she used to say. The night sky was magnificent, the perfect aperitif. She glided through the service, never saying a word, radiating life. Edith was real, as real as life can get. But that civilized evening was in truth a recreation as well. Night in and night out for two years. The tea house flourished as a ginned up theatrical. Curtain up, the candlelit artifice of as if. As if you could go have your chocolate cake and eat it too. As if the world were at peace and securing a reservation for a night. On the town was the paramount obstacle in your pseudonymous life in Never Never Land. As if the bomb vanished by dint of artful stagecraft of convivial artifice, a dress rehearsal for the out of sight, out of mind of the Cold World War. We never thought it could become an abstraction again, not after Hiroshima. Edith never once mentioned the bomb to me, not once, though she knew full well what we were up to. She saw right through me in a way only Marguerite could. Yes, we were all playing a role. She still calls me Mr. Baker. But the circumlocutions and nom de guerres were spurs to wear cowboy boots and Indian feathers, to let our hair down and revel in life at its most ensorceling. Edith is stage, manner, is stage manager and dramaturge. The tea house serves a potlatch. She was a bemused presence, a muse. After our curtain call, when she chases us out for the last time, I suspect she will have the final word. And you were the great seer the angel from the future, she looked to you for the magic word, as did we all. Who can forget your stirring sermon on the Mesa? You brought the blueprint for the deus ex to the hill, the great hope you called it, the weapon to end all war, the deliverance machine. You too vanquished necessary evil. If I were the American Prometheus, you were the Thaumaturge. The Danish Magus. Two together can see, said Homer. And if it weren't for the famous photograph of a beaming Niels Bohr on skis on Sawyer Hill, no one would have known you were here at all. I want to tell you, 
All the producers and biographers, not me, but Bohr, he was the greatest presence at Los Alamos, especially when he was in Washington and London doing atomic diplomacy, a magic trick performed by Mr. Baker, here, but not here, there, but where, doomsday one day, deliver, deliverance the next, the ultimate double slit, double bind. Now you see the bomb, now you see international control, now you see one world, now you see none. Quantum tunneling, your precocious feat of ledger domain, which no doubt is responsible for us being back here in our skins and at the height of our powers, alive for a night, reflecting on 75 years of lucking out big time. I fear Providence has maxed out our saving mankind. Enough to get us out of the 20th century alive, it's done, shot its wad, the miracle of miracles, mom. Excellent. Now, Nemesis seems to be in charge. Non. And judging from the doomsday clock, I'd say the Bohr-Oppenheimer certainty principle is being tested again. State-of-the-art time is nine and counting. Let's roll the dice again, pushing our luck indeed. The arms race, take two. Yes, hope is in short supply and the bomb remains on the back burner. When nuclear winter not getting the attention it deserves. But Edith Ragout, Edith's Ragout smells divine, and I am too hungry to pursue this dialogue any further. I have a sneaking suspicion the bomb will boil over once our Hungarian gets here. Late as ever, not Wigner, I'm afraid. What say we go outside to smoke and clear our heads, give Olber's paradox our full attention? I think our playwright wouldn't mind. He probably needs a break as well. <laughs> Zillar shows up in act in scene three. Z sorry. Zillar shows up in scene three. And then, then Edward Teller shows up in act two. And then Sakharov, they all get together in act three. Sakharov shows up. I wanted to get the Russian in there. Father, he was a great humanitarian. Uh, he, he was the father of the Soviet H bomb. And then he became a great, a great humanitarian. He went in a different direction. Tell her what the other direction. You you said uh, in a, when we first met that all the money um, in Hollywood these days was in television. I mean, I'd like to see <laughs> an in depth in depth ex exploration of, of this moment in world history, kind of played out over two or three years. You know, from the beginnings, you know, the informal conversations, the debates. Um, seems like it would be an incredibly rich thing for. But, but uh, Los Alamos has been it, it's been done to um, it's been done so often in, in such cliche. I mean, I, I I sat once. I went to the review for the Nation. Uh, a BBC docudrama about Los Alamos, and I sat I sat in this room for eight hours straight, watching eight episodes, and it was just a little shallow. I mean, it just came out of it. Can you explain? It was just vapid. I mean, it was just vapid. It was just the guy had no idea really what what happened. The characters were, were one dimensional. I mean, you know, I mean, it's just it's the kind of thing like you know, you watch five minutes and you know, get me out of this. I had to sit in there for eight hours and watch this. Like, oh, Jesus. And then, of course, the nation, did, they, <laughs> the nation did not accept the review because it's so negative. So. You have a question? Just piggyback off of, to piggyback off of, of uh, that <coughs> discussion, um, you know, if a part of the your point is how these multi-dimensional characters have, you know, been through story flattened in their own way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, Oppenheimer uh, especially. Bohr, nobody, hardly anybody knows anything about Niels Bohr being up there. He was there six times for extended visits. He, 
the other time, the other times he was in Washington and London trying to convince FDR and Churchill and to, to get Stalin on board and for international control, which was, really was the only, I think the only, <clears throat> the only um, uh, but at the very beginning, the Bohr Oppenheimer rescue of humankind, I think, was the only viable way to go. And it, you know, it ended up in an arms race. And we lucked out. We got out of the 20th century a lot, of, you know, by, by hook, you know. But. And I, I wanted to bring up a conversation we had um, yesterday about the Manhattan Project National Park that they're trying right, to right, build right, in. Right. New Mexico and uh, Los Alamos, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and w we just had this discussion about maybe you know movies and um, mm -hmm. don't capture the life that mm -hmm. is these you know scientists who right. helped right. build the bomb. What are your expectations of something like a national park that actually brings the visitor into the Houses where they used to live. Do you ha are you well, optimistic uh, with? Well, you can go up to Los Alamos and you can go up to Bathtub Row and you can see Fuller Lodge and all these places. There's Oppenheimer's houses is still there. Um, so I mean, you can go up, you can do the tour, and you can go to the museum. You know. Um, so I mean, it's not like it's not like it's, it hasn't. There's the Atomic Heritage Project has 500 oral 500 oral histories of people who worked on the project. And those, some of them are very exciting, very good. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, let's not forget Los Alamos, Oak Ridge, and Hanford. Um, and Hanford was really the Wild West. There's 50,000 construction workers there. They raised hell, they killed. There, was, there were drugs, there were suicides almost every day. Uh, prostitution rings, you name it, was there. You know, I mean, there's nothing up in the nothing up in the desert of eastern Washington. It, it's, you know, you worked hard and then you, you went out and, you know, and you, they, they recruited, they recruited, most of the workers came from the south, the deep south, and they also recruited blacks. So you had instant race, you know, so, yeah. yeah. So I guess uh, that's the wild, that hasn't really been portrayed. Los Alamos has been done to death, I think. But it hasn't been done well. No, um, it has. So. No, it has. No, it has. But my hope, my play, my play. Actually, I think a play is better for the, for for these kinds of issues, yeah. uh, where we really get into. I mean, I'm writing also a study of uh, of the atomic of the atomic scientists. So, um, yeah. so I have two different questions. Unless somebody else wants to. No, go ahead. Um, two completely different questions. One is. Um, whether you could talk about the ways in which your time in the Navy influenced your perspective, um, because it's not um, it's not an experience that every writer <laughs> has, to put it mildly. Um, so I wonder how that influenced your, your thoughts about all this. That's well, well, uh, when I was in the Navy, I was an electronics technician, and and. The weapon system that I worked on was a destroyer out of Norfolk, and the, the weapon system I worked on was a drone anti-submarine helicopter. It was about 14 feet long, had counter-rotational blades. It was the first really digital uh, drone weapon system in, in the U.S. Navy. Uh, we lost three of these things, but we flew them extensively. Um, and one of one of the things they carried, they carried dummy. We had the anti-submarine torpedoes, two of them were attached to these things. And there were three anti, there were two anti-submarine, um, I'm sorry, there were two nuclear, two nuclear uh, torpedoes in, in the weapons bay right next door. Uh, and one was for the other, the ASROC. Um, so we carried three sub-kiloton and we had, we had actually there was a, there was a guard on, on duty 24 hours even at sea to prevent, you know, whatever. We used to have all these ABC drills where we we drill for, uh, you know, atomic warfare. You know, you had a, you had a surface burst uh, 4,000 4, yards off your port bow, you know, and then you locked down the ship and then you had this emergency wash 
down system and all that. Anyway, so we, we drilled pretty extensively for nuclear war. I always thought it was a big joke. Uh, but, but I was so... You thought it was a joke. Oh, yeah. This is what, I, year, yeah. what year are we talking about? Oh, this, this is the mid-60s. Um, so, I mean, I, I, was, I went in right after high school, 18. I was going to be a naval officer. That was the, the goal. But uh, anyway, things turned out differently. I didn't get on and fly on a submarine because of my vision. So I ended up in a destroyer, uh, which, is, which was actually older than I was. Um, but you know, the last time I was in Europe, I came in the uniform of the U.S. Navy and I had three, three nuclear weapons on my ship. So, you know, this is, this is, that was the Marshall visit. This is the erratic one, you know. So, um, but, I don't, but what happened is I, I got really consumed with the idea of going to college and, and be a physics major. I wanted desperately to, to get a PhD in physics, and, um, and um, but I, 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 was, I had no idea, of, I wasn't political at all. I was consumed with technology. Because um, you said in your talk that you'd been writing this play all your life, so I just- Yeah, well that's, that that's, you know, that's very loosely, yeah, behind my back most of it, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but when I when I got out of the Navy and I went, I did get be a, I got to be a physics major and 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 everybody was telling me, well, you know, I was I just I got out of the Navy and it was 1960 fall of 67, and then I went and I, and I transferred to Berkeley and I got married and I had a son and you know I was a married student at Berkeley and it's 1968. I've, read, I've written about it in the L.A. Review of Books if you want to look at them. Um, and that was my awakening, my political awakening. I just had no, I was at, literally at sea for three years. I had no idea what was going on. And uh, so suddenly you're thrust into the, you know, the worst of the state of siege years there at Berkeley. And uh, so, uh, so I, got, I, I, grew, I became politicized, but it, it was a gradual process. Well, it wasn't, it was more than gradual. It was, it was like pulling teeth, actually. Uh, and, uh, but I did, I did realize that that Edward Teller was supposed to be one of my teachers, and I refused to have him teach me. and And I, I always I always thought that Oppenheimer's picture should have been on the on the department uh, on the department wall there. They had all the, they had the Rogues Gallery of everybody, all the Nobel laureates and everybody. I thought his picture should be up there. And then I got I got there was a there was one one physicist at Berkeley who had a political conscience. And uh, we started going out to Lawrence Livermore, which is where the nuclear weapons are designed. Uh, uh, it's about 40 miles from Berkeley. Um, and, uh, and, we started, and I started protesting, and then I got involved in the whole, you know, gradually my, my conscience is, you know, you know, got raised. But it was, a, it was, it was, a, it was a, you know, it wasn't, wasn't a fun thing to go through, and I, plus on top of that, I had full load, and also I was married. Had a, I just had a son, and and uh, <clears throat> and I was also a veteran for peace. So you know, it was between Vietnam. So I, I, I did the Berkeley Tripo. So I did Auschwitz, Hiroshima, and, and Vietnam. Those were the three in my majors. I think you know. Yeah. My, oh, you have a second question, right? Oh. Okay. Hi, thanks for that. Uh, I think you mentioned it yesterday and you repeated it today as well, that the civilization started in Indus Valley and it's going to end there. So I was just wondering if that's like a, a poetic kind of thing that you help think or is there is it your analysis, or is there something well, that, you, I, that you know? You know I'm, because I'm, I'm worried because I have to go back tomorrow, and I should know if there's something that you know, and I don't know. No. I have family there. Oh, I, I only know that you know it's a toss-up between Mesopotamia or the Indus Valley, where civilization literally began, where cities started. So I always figure, you know, there's the symmetry here. You know, we start there, we might as well end there. So you know, uh, but you know, I'm. I'm Obviously, I'm pessimistic about the future, but I'm, you know, I'm not entirely unhopeful. Uh, I think, for instance, that Trump is probably the best thing that's happened to American democracy in 40 years. And I think because, because these issues are so pressing right now, and that 
um, uh, that paradoxically, I think that we have no choice but to address this thing. And I think precisely because we have fools like Putin and Trump and uh, the two premiers in India and Pakistan, I think, I think uh, the galvanic is there and it's only a question. It's really now literally in our, in our, our laps to do this. So we have no choice in this. The 21st century, we have to address near-term and long-term prospects for this planet in this century. Uh, we got a free ride out of the 20th century. We, we've, we're not going to get a, a free ride in the 21st. I think Nemesis really is in control right now. And uh, so, you know, um, good luck to us. Did you have your second question, Susan? Do you want to ask? You have a lot to say about it, but in the line, um, you know, the Faust Hamlet uh, Prometheus line, which are, of course, those are the figures that he gets traditionally compared right, right, to. Right. In, in the line that you right. wrote, you're both stating, but also having him be self-reflective or even ironic about it. And I just wondered if you could say a little more about that. The yeah. Well, I mean, for instance, uh, the play you're going to go see Sunday night, he actually sued Kippard, the playwright, for that. Uh, he hated the ending, which he said it turned, it turned, a, it turned a, a farce into a tragedy. That's his famous quote about that play. And, and he hated it. And uh, I think I've always been extremely ambivalent about Oppenheimer. Um, eh, my fr a friend, my friend is uh, Marty Sherwin, who's co-author co of a Pulitzer Prize-winning biography of Oppenheimer. Uh, we've had long discussions about him. Uh, I always thought that Niels Bohr always gets the short, <coughs> short end of the stick. Uh, people don't realize that Niels Bohr, Niels Bohr essentially was the tutor to Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer always, Oppenheimer didn't look up to very many people, but he certainly did look up to Niels Bohr and. Um, Edith Warner, who knew both of them extremely well, always thought that that Niels Bohr was was head and shoulders above Oppenheimer. No, no matter how, how no matter how much no no just no it wasn't intellectually no I mean you know hardly hardly anybody could, could hold a candle to Oppenheimer as far as intellect goes. But she, yes, character integrity yeah character. She always loved you know she loved Niels Bohr. And, she, she, she always hoped that after the war he would come back and see her. He never did. So now he, now in this play he will. <laughs> Thank you. And I just have one final question. I mean, going back to Susan's uh, talk and this idea of this um, kind of retrospective rationale for dropping the right, bomb. I mean, right, were right. you aware, well, I mean, when you became um, politically aware uh -huh. in the late 60s, uh -huh. um, were, were any discussions happening at the time um, among, you know, the people well, who still had enough historical knowledge to have been there and to know that it was actually different? Well, I mean, half, half of my, half of my, half of my uh, professors in the physics department were right. Los Alamos veterans. Yeah. Some of them were working on Jason, which was... Um, but I'll support people Hiroshima having to carry the burden of that. But, um, but the ABM, the ABM controversy was quite quite real. I remember that. Um, we at Berkeley we formed the first, I think, the first accredited course in the country in, on the social responsibility of science. That was in 1969. So uh, we got that going. So the whole field of you know science and society really got started there, um, but Hiroshima, you know, I, except for Al Provis's book, uh, Hiroshima wasn't. I was I, I've become more and more preoccupied with Auschwitz than I did with mm. Hiroshima. You more what? Yeah. With, with Auschwitz, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I read I read Hannah Arendt, you know. Fest and all these things. Mm -hmm. so, but 
But yeah, it was it was always in the back. I mean, you know, you couldn't you couldn't look at their professors, and you know, you couldn't you know, these people were radioactive. The whole the whole department was radioactive. So, you know, for you had you had to come to terms with these guys at some point. So. Thank you very much okay. for coming all the way here. Um, conference um, with all the contributions I think we did at least achieve something we have started a conversation where it will lead us uh, we don't know I'd l also like to take the opportunity to thank uh, the people who have made this technically possible Gore and Jonas <laughs> and Gabriele downstairs who made it uh, administratively possible um, and our colleague and friend, Andreas, who refilled the coffee and the likes. All my thanks to them and all my thanks to you.